Welcome to The Facts. I'm Mike Osted, and this week we're going to talk about the 10 ballot measures that are going to face the South Dakota voters coming on in November's election. My guest this week is Representative Isaac Lateral from the T in Harrisburg area. Isaac, thanks for being aboard. Uh, tell us a little bit about your position in the legislature and your district. Sure. Thanks, Mike, for having me on. Um, I've been a representative for four years, and my district includes parts of Sioux Falls in the southern area, as well as the towns of T, Lennox, and Harrisburg. And it's really been an honor to represent those people. And a lot of interesting things uh, we see in the state legislature come through, including some of these ballot initiatives and constitutional amendments that we're going to be talking about today. Let's go through some of these ballot measures today. And uh, through the order, they that the people are going to see here. Before we do that, let's talk about these ballot measures. Some are amendments, mm -hmm. some are referred laws, and some are initiated measures. Uh, can we go through some of that minutia and say, is there an order of importance or something more concerned on these or what those titles mean? Sure thing. Well, definitely the most important issues that we're going to be voting on are the constitutional amendments. Because as you may know, constitutional amendments actually limit what the legislature can and can't do. It's the highest order of law in our state. And the constitutional amendments can get on the ballot one of two ways. They can either be passed by the legislature as in the form of a resolution, then placing them on the ballot for the people to approve or disapprove, or they can also be put on the ballot by initiated measure. But to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot, because it is such a serious thing, it takes a higher number of signatures to get that on the ballot. And then you move down to the initiated measures, which are laws, just like laws that the legislature could pass, except for these ones are initiated by a citizen, and they start with a petition drive to get the ballot, the ballot measure on the ballot, and then if the people vote in a majority for the initiated measure, that becomes law, just as if the legislature and the governor had signed it. And the last one is the referred laws. Referred laws are laws that have been passed by the legislature, but then someone in, as a citizen had a problem with that law and they decided they wanted to refer it to the ballot. They wanted the people to have a second shot at approving or disapproving. So they'll gather the number of signatures required to get that measure that has already passed onto the ballot for the people to take a look at it. So this is done when someone's unhappy with the law or usually when someone's unhappy with what the legislature did in a particular case. So these measures do need a petition from the people of the state, need to get signatures, X amount of signatures. And Correct. for the, the uh, constitutional amendments, how many signatures are needed to get? It's, it's tens of thousands. I don't know the specific number, but it's a lot of signatures that you need to get. And on the referred laws and initiated measures, it's not quite that significant of numbers. It's still a lot of signatures. It takes a big effort, but it's a little less um, as far as the requirements. Okay, so when people are going to show up to the polls mm -hmm. um, on Tuesday, November 8th, the South Dakota voters are going to see 10 different, different measures right. that uh, they can opt to vote for and study up on, and that's what we're going to get into today. Mm -hmm. Let's start with a list of these 10. Um, the first one is a constitutional amendment, the one of the more serious, uh, one of the more weighted measures that mm -hmm. uh, go through the legislature. Uh, the Board of Regents or the Tech Schools, this is Constitutional Amendment R. Uh, you, what are the notes and what is, what is the information you have on the Tech Schools Constitutional Amendment R, the first one? Sure. Well, first I'll talk about how the education system is set up in South Dakota right now. We have our four tech schools, which includes Watertown, Mitchell, Sioux Falls, and Rapid City. And those are all actually governed by the State Department of Education, the same department that governs our K-12 system. And then we have the Board of Regents, which is an independent body. Those members who govern the universities are appointed by the governor. And so the goal of Constitutional Amendment R would be to take the tech schools out of the K-12 system, but instead of putting them into the university system with the Board of Regents, they would establish its own governing body uh, with members appointed by the legislature. And what it would do is it actually give the state the ability to do more in terms of technical education. And it's really, it is a significant measure because it's amending the Constitution and it's creating a new authorized governing body. Um, it's also going to have ongoing authority and budgetary needs. The legislature, as it says in the constitutional amendment, will then pass a bill that has different rules and funding measures relating to it. So this will just create the structure and then the legislature will come and flesh out the details. 
Um, the ones who are pushing this measure, they really feel strongly that the state should do more in terms of technical education to make sure we have a strong workforce. And people who are a little bit opposed to this measure think that we shouldn't expand the state's role in providing the technical education. They may be all for you know, technical education and workforce development, but they don't believe the state should increase their particular role. They believe that should be left privately. So I would leave it up to the people to decide which they think is more important. This is probably, some of these issues have probably gone up through the legislature before on Board of Regents control or K through 12 control. Yeah. Is it just a delayed process? People want to kind of speed this up or what? Um... You're absolutely right that it is an issue that is a kind of a tension, you know, in the legislature every year. But in this case, because the Constitution actually defines the authority of the Board of Regents, this is the only way to make the technical education schools uh, have a clear separate governing body is to amend the Constitution and so that's why it was done this way. If it could be done a different way I believe that that's what the uh, legislature would have done um, but. All right very good let's go down the list to the second uh, option on the ballot mm -hmm. which is uh, another constitutional amendment S. It's a um, little more obscure it hasn't gotten a whole lot of a lot of these haven't gotten a lot of front and center attention mm -hmm. is the crime victims rights um, other states have, have looked into this and adopted that. What is your summary and description on, on this and who are the supporters and, and yeah. where's this coming from? Constitutional Amendment S is also referred to as Marcy's Law and we have been seeing some TV commercials on it. There's kind of a um, big push to educate people on it and I'm a supporter of Constitutional Amendment S. What it does is it adds victims rights to our state constitution. As you know, um, when someone is accused of a crime, we have constitutional rights of due process and other things in, that are protected. But the victims of those crimes currently don't have any rights that are protected in the Constitution. Now, there are a lot of victims' rights enclosed in the Victims' Rights Act. We have passed into law certain rights for victims. And if we pass this constitutional amendment, it will take some of those rights that already exist in law and it'll put them in the Constitution. And it'll also add some additional constitutional rights for people who have been victimized by crime. Uh, and some of the supporters of this, have, or some of the opponents of this are maybe some of the, in the Bar Association and maybe some state attorneys associations as it could take up more time and resources. Right. How would, you, how would, how would uh, proponents of this respond to that? Well, the people who are against the amendment, like you said, they're not actually against victims' rights, so I want to be clear that uh, people have good faith reasons for being opposed to it, since there already are a lot of victim rights in state law. But they do believe it'll increase the costs for the counties. And, you know, the county budgets are an area of contention for people, and they feel like it will make um, us spend more resources on minor crimes, and that might take resources away from major crimes. Because some of the rights that are included in this uh, Amendment S are requiring the state's attorney during the proceedings to consult with the victim and or the family members if they request to do so. Now, personally, I'm not convinced those arguments are that big of a concern. I don't think in other states there's been significant cost increases from passing this measure. And it, I don't think it violates any of the rights of the accused. I haven't seen that to be clearly proven. And one other thing is it doesn't require the um, state to confer with every single victim of every crime. It only gives rights to those victims. If they feel that they need to be heard in the proceedings, they can step forward and then we're required to make sure they're included in the process. So it is an important measure though, so I recommend that people do some research on it and figure out what they think and make a good decision. All right, very good. We have a lot to cover in the next segment. We'll be back in a minute. Meet the Lion Hillary doll. Press her and she'll tell one of her unbelievable tales. When I got off the plane in Bosnia, I had to dodge sniper fire. I made a mistake and, you know, I had a different memory and my, uh, uh, you know, my uh, staff and others have, uh, you know, all kind of come together trying to sort out. Uh, um, so I made a mistake. Not a single one of my emails was classified. Documents are being upgraded at the request of the intelligence community because they contain a category of top secret information. That I was closing down the coal mines was all taken out of context. We're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. 
It's just a security inquiry. There's no FBI criminal investigation. I'm not familiar with the term security inquiry. We're conducting an investigation. That's what we do. I don't believe I ever lied to the public. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. Get your Lion Hillary doll today. Press her and she'll tell 18 unbelievable tales. Only $24.99 includes free shipping. Order today at www.lionhillarydoll.com. <laughs> Welcome back to The Facts. We're going to continue talking about the 10 ballot measures that are going to face South Dakota voters on November 8th election. Uh, we've covered the first two. Uh, my guest is with us is Isaac Lateral. And let's, let's continue with that. The third one on the list that we're going to be looking at on the ballot measure is Constitutional Amendment T. And that involves redistricting state legislative districts. As a legislator in a, in, in a certain district, you know some things about this too. Tell us about what's going on there. Well, amendment T, I like to call it, uh, T is for terrible. I think it's a terrible amendment. I like to call it the Partisan Redistricting Commission because what it does, it will actually make our redistricting process more partisan. It's going to create a new commission and then it's going to give political parties, it's going to mandate that different political parties be on that commission. And the new commission would actually give an advantage to Democrats who they want to seek to create districts to give themselves an advantage instead of having it based on geography and population as much the way it is now. I think the current process works great. Uh, right now it's nonpartisan. The legislature uh, decides. And what we did last time when we had the redistricting um, situation is we aimed to keep uh, districts that were based on geography. So we tried to keep people in the communities and the counties that they lived and worked in. And it really worked great. Last time, we kept nearly all the counties and the cities whole. So we didn't have any really weird districts where if you are on this side of the town, you know, you're in one district, but if you're in that side, you're in another district. We really tried hard to make sure that you're voting with the people that you lived with. So, you know, it's my, my district, I think, is an example. It's wholly contained in Lincoln County. It's the north part of Lincoln County. And it has T, Harrisburg, Lenox, and parts of southern Sioux Falls. And there's nothing strange at all about the shape. So th this was brought on by certain groups? Or would it, favor some, would it favor a different group in another election cycle where another party might be in the minority? Or does it just affect somebody specific? Well, I think the, the people who are pushing this measure, they really actually want to have... Uh, more advantages for Democrats, even if there's not a lot of Democrats in the state. Uh, there's, um, in this case, we had Peggy Gibson, who is one of the more liberal members of the legislature. She put in a request that she wanted to have some towns and counties in her um, area all contained in one legislative district instead of splitting them up. And the commission that did the redistricting granted that request even though it was actually an advantage to Democrats and not Republicans because it kept more people whole in terms of geography and being consolidated into one district. So that was really the aim. And the other thing is that this plan that we approve and the way we do it now, it has to be approved by the Justice uh, Department. Obama Justice Department approved this plan and it was widely received as very fair. There wasn't gerrymandering, which is where you have really strange drawn lines just to get a certain person into a certain district, things like that. So the way we do it now is fair. Um, and because I represent the city of T, I have to be very clear what I'm referring to. But I have to say vote no on Amendment T. What, uh, when you're going back to this T, there's the new proposed commission. Would that be less accountable? Is that an argument? Um, whether it would be less or more accountable, I'm not sure. I think it would give political parties more influence over the process and I think it really wouldn't be good for people so okay the next one is another constitutional amendment U, and that is titled the interest rates capping at 18 percent voluntary for certain loan companies tell us a little bit about that well that's what it says in the title but amendment U is unbelievable I actually think that this is the worst measure on the ballot and what it does is actually it's a dishonest measure. It's brought by the predatory lenders. What they did is they saw that the people were rising up and gathering petitions to limit interest rates on payday loans to 
So the amendment you people, what they did is they started their own petition, but they did a constitutional amendment, which as we discussed earlier is a stronger measure. And what their amendment would do is actually limit interest rate uh, caps at all. Now it says that the cap is at 18%, but if you read the language, it says, you know, 18% unless a different rate is agreed to in writing. And then the next sentence says, and further, all laws that, you know, limit interest rates are invalid unless it, you're allowed to set any rate you want in writing. So it's really, really shady. It actually would prevent any interest rate limitations at all if this passes. And the payday lenders, they say they're just trying to help people, but then they do this kind of slimy, underhanded thing, and they basically show that they'll go to any lengths to enrich themselves. So I would definitely say you have to vote no on Amendment U, and yes on Measure 21, which is the other 36% cap. Okay. What, what kind of support is getting on these, these measures behind it? Is there certain money that flow that we're seeing from one side or the other that, um, that, that we know about? Well, I know that the uh, funding for the Amendment U is coming from the payday loan people. So they have been doing advertisements trying to deceive people into thinking that if they vote for Amendment U, they're going to limit payday lenders. But really, they will expand the um, authority of payday lenders, and they're going to prevent any caps from ever being imposed. And so that's why I've supported Measure 21. I even circulated petitions myself to get this interest rate cap passed. So Measure 21 is a referred law and what it does is it puts a 36 percent cap on and it'll end the current payday lending practices where there are very high interest rate loans and it will what it'll mean is that certain people with bad credit will have less access to these ultra high interest short-term loans but the reason i think that it is a good thing because in the end it's going to help the economy instead of going and getting further trapped in a cycle of debt people are going to say you know i'm in a tough spot right now i really need to get some help I can't perpetuate this by getting another payday loan and just falling deeper and deeper into debt. So when we pass Measure 21, the 36% cap, then people will, I feel, get more help and there'll be less debt in the economy. So vote no on Amendment U, yes on 21 is my opinion. Well, I appreciate you taking the stance and maybe the lightning rod. Uh, what would be some of the objections, though, that the, the opponents say, well, some of these people, they can't get they have difficult time getting credit. You know, banks aren't going to loan them or get them by for certain expenses. But they're there to help the, a certain section of people that might not be able to get credit anywhere else. How do you, how do you, over, what is your argument there? Well, the difficulty is that people who object to any of these limits, um, they say that you shouldn't be able to have the government regulate what kind of contracts that private businesses can go into. And while that's true in a general sense, it's not good to have the government over-regulating things. With the financial sector, there is already so many things that we as a state have put into law that actually help the institutions, the financial institutions, and, and make it possible to do these payday lending. So I believe it's reasonable to have a 36% cap. And I do understand that people are, are against it, but I don't think that there will be ramifications that it will be too extreme on the negative side if we're past the 36 percent cap. Okay, well very good. We're halfway through the 10 ballot measures that are going to be facing South Dakota voters on November 8th. We're going to come back after the break and talk about the next five. I've heard the truth. truth, 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 truth. Know what I want are the answers. You are the only one I trust. Welcome back to The Facts. We are continuing our talk with the 10 ballot measures facing South Dakota voters on Tuesday, November 8th. We're on number six. And with us is our guest, continuing, Isaac Latterell, representative of District 6, T, Harrisburg and Lenox area. Uh, getting into number six on that ballot measure list is Constitutional Amendment V. This is one that might be referred to as the uh, nonpartisan elections that, that some have brought forward. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, Amendment V is a very bad idea. It gives politicians the right to hide their party affiliation when they go on the ballot. And with as busy as people are, they don't always have the opportunity to re uh, research every single person. So I believe that the voters have a right to know if a person is affiliated with a certain party or not. 
If someone supports Hillary Clinton and supports that party, I think the voters have the right to know that when they vote for them. Uh, you can always run as an independent. If you don't want to be affiliated with the party, you're already free to do that. So V is a very bad idea. And I think that if we pass it, it would be a lot less transparent elections. Okay, there are a few that argue, are the devil's advocate, that they might they don't want to be tied to a party and they um, feel obligated to sign up for one or another and that uh, makes them beholden to a certain party. Is that uh, a fair argument? Well, right now we can still, we see independent numbers are growing and people have the right to run as that. So I don't think it's actually uh, an argument that is one that we need to be concerned about. I think the bigger issue is the transparency that would be reduced if people were allowed to hide their party affiliation. It doesn't remove their party. It just allows them to hide it. Okay, very good. Next on the list is on the ballot measures is number seven. That's going to be initiated measure number 22, and that's a campaign finance, publicly financed elections taken over. Do, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's hilarious that this one even made it onto the ballot in the first place. Uh, with measure 22, basically they would take your tax dollars and then they'd fund maybe some radical candidates who I, whose ideas are so bad they couldn't get anyone to support them or they couldn't get anyone to donate to their campaign but now instead of taking your taxes and spending them on an important public um, needs they're actually going to take them and fund radical politicians uh, campaigns giving your tax dollars giving people a voice who would otherwise have one so it's really a bad thing I would I would definitely vote no on it I think it's silly that it's on the ballot that they were able to get on there. So Okay, and who would the they be on controlling the campaign di distribution of the funds? Be taken out of taxpayers, would some committee decide this? Or how, how would that work if this were to somehow go through? Well, I don't know the specifics. Basically, it would be if you get on the ballot and you get, um, you get a certain amount of money to run your campaign, that would be from the state treasury, and it would require a tax increase just to be funded. So. I don't think that uh, people want to be taxed more, especially not to fund politicians' campaigns. Okay, very good. Moving on the list, number eight is initiated measure number 23, and that is, uh, that is uh, right for organizations and outfits to charge fees for representation. Yeah. What, let, it's a really you, confusing you, title. You, you've been able to cut through some of these things pretty well. What, what is, what's this about and who's... who's pushing this. Sure. Well, measure 23 really is about forced unionizations. And if you work at a company in South Dakota right now, we believe that you have the right to join a union or not join a union. But you shouldn't be forced to spend money to join a union who's doing things you don't agree with. So when the title says allows organizations to charge a fee for service, what they're really saying is that they're going to speak on your behalf and they're going to say something you may not agree with, but then they're going to charge you for the service they're providing, which is speaking on your behalf. It's just a way to circumvent the laws which protect the workers' rights and basically force you to pay for a union and to fund their activities even if you don't agree with them. And We've had a long-standing tradition of having the right to work, the right to join a union, or the right not to, and I think we should keep that and we should vote no on 23. It's, really, it's funded by a group out of Minnesota, a, for labor unions out of Minnesota. That's where the money's coming from? That's what I've heard. Okay. So you, this does not interfere with a worker's choice to join or not join a union? No, it does not. It's just the opt to have fees forced to be taken out, forced, according no, to your... Correct. No required it. Okay, very good. On number nine on the list, we've got a referred law 19, and that is election petitions. Another ambiguous thing. Sure. What is the attorney's general description or your description? Summarize that for us. Sure. Most of the law was a cleanup uh, in terms of the dates for filing petitions and running for office. There's a lot of different areas of law that were adjusted. So we had different measures passed in terms of how you can challenge signatures on a petition. And in order to accommodate that, this law was passed, changing the filing deadline earlier. That would give people enough time to do the challenges, enough time to certify the ballots, print the ballots, all that kind of thing. So most of those measures I support. Uh, there wasn't an, an item in the bill which required, if you wanted to run as an independent, under current law, you could get anyone to sign your petition and run for office as an independent. If this law passes, then you will only have independents be able to sign your petition. And right now, there is a lot of independents in South Dakota, um, but they're not the majority. So it would, 
If the law passes, it reduces the number of people that will be able to sign your petition if you want to run for an independent. So that's some concern to look out for when people are evaluating this Measure 19. So this has already faced the legislature to some degree? Yes, it always went through legislature, and that's why it's a referred law. It was put to the ballot to see what the voters think about it. Okay, and what are your thoughts on this, on, on either way on the passing of well, this? Like I said, I, I don't know that it's a good idea to limit uh, the number of people who can sign independent petitions, but um, there are a lot of good measures in the bill, too. So okay. I'll probably be supporting the bill, um, but I think people should take a look at it, make sure it, on the whole it's what they want. All right, and then we're coming up to number 10, Referred Law 20 is a youth minimum wage. It would differentiate wages to be paid to a certain age group in the workforce in South Dakota by state law. Mm -hmm. what, what's going on there? Well, uh, Referred Law 20 was passed by the legislature, and I definitely think that people should vote yes on 20. What it does is it lowers the minimum wage for kids under 18 by about a dollar to $7.50. So some young people or jobs, they aren't really skilled jobs or the people might not have the skills to be worth eight fifty five, and this law if it doesn't pass then we will basically be outlawing people from hiring kids at a rate under eight dollars and fifty five cents so if the job isn't worth that the job's not going to be created here's an example let's say you wanted to hire your friend's kid to do a job like filing papers or just to teach him the value of hard work Maybe you needed it done, but it really wasn't worth paying, you know, up to $9 an hour to do. So uh, it's important that we have a lower wage available so that kids can get that first job and they can learn skills and they can improve their skills and finally have skills that are worth more money. But if we just mandate that you have to pay everyone a super high rate, even for those really low-skilled jobs, we'll actually be pricing the kids out of the market and they won't be able to get that first job on the ladder. So a no on... T no on referred law 20, the last ballot measure. No, we have to vote yes on this one. It was passed by the legislature, okay. and now it's referred to the ballot. So the people, hopefully, will approve it. What it does is it adjusts the minimum wage downward for the people under 18. Do you have any recommendations for those who don't really know or studied up on the issues? Should they leave it blank, or should they, if they don't have a chance to study up and get well-versed as you, what, what would you recommend? Well, the first step is to go to the Secretary of State website, and there's pro and cons listed in the ballot pamphlet. They can also uh, go to my website, isaaclaterell.com. I'll list out the, some of the points that I made here today there. Um, and you can also ask your legislator. It's a good opportunity to get in touch with the person representing you and take, get their take on it. Okay, very good. Thank you for being a guest again, Isaac Laterell, District 6. Glad to be here. Thank you. And that's it for this week on the facts of the ballot measures. We'll see you next week.